Deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great! Folks, if you have your Bibles with you uh, this morning, or you look it up on your phones, uh, it's Isaiah 43. And uh, during this little portion uh, we were reading uh, this morning, it's, it's the children of Israel had been in exile in Babylon, and Isaiah was trying to encourage them. Uh, we see that the, the children of Israel, they had sinned and had gone far away from God. And because they'd sinned and gone far away from God, they were sent down into exile uh, there in Babylon. And here Isaiah is trying to encourage them. They were going through difficult times and difficult days. But here Isaiah was trying to encourage them. And this morning we want to look at Isaiah's picture of where they were in Christ. 
and also the picture of of who Christ is or who the Lord is. And there's a wonderful picture there of who the Lord is. We're going to read uh, the first 17 verses of this little portion together. So Isaiah 43, beginning to read at verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east, and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from, from afar, and my daughters from the ends of, of the earth. For every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my, for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the, the blind people that have eyes, and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled, who among them can declare this, and show us former things. Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. For I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me, there is no Savior. I have declared and have said, I have showed, and there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I am sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power, they shall lie down together. They shall, not, they shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as thou. And we'll finish the reading of God's word there at the end of verse 17 together. We trust it'll be a blessing to us. And as we bring a few thoughts from this after uh, a wee while. Folks, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to uh, turn to this little portion in Isaiah 43. And as I said, there's so much in this, you could preach many a sermon on it. And there, there are so many wonderful thoughts that we can look at. Uh, this chapter is a continuation from the chapters that have gone before. Uh, it's speaking there really about the, about the judgment that was going to come upon God's people because they had fallen into sin, they had continued in sin. And uh, the Lord had rebuked them by sending them, sending them down uh, into captivity in Babylon. And here we see a people down in Babylon. We see a people who were, who were dismayed. We see a people who, who had gone through some very difficult times of suffering. And here in this lovely little portion that we're reading from Isaiah 43, we see Isaiah speaking to the, the people themselves. 
And Isaiah wanted to comfort them. He wanted to reassure them. He wanted to remind them of a promised deliverance. In other words, he wanted to say, listen, look, you can comfort yourself because God says he'll not leave you. He'll not forsake you. You can reassure yourself because he's here with you. Although you're in a foreign land and although you're in captivity, God is there. And he also wanted to remind them that God had promised, yes, that he would bring them back out of captivity and he would bring them back to the promised land land. And this chapter and this little portion here that we're looking at this morning, it longs to remind the people that God is their, their protector. And it's not wonderful even in the days we're living in to know that God is our wonderful protector. He's the one who looks after us. He's the one who cares for us. And there's nothing comes our path, but the Lord does not know before. And the Lord is not with us as we are going through them. And he tells them that he was going to come and that he was going to bring deliverance to the nation. Um, verse 14, if you read there through, thus saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your, for your sake. And, and sometimes when we go through difficult times, we say, well, you, you know, what have we done wrong? Or have we done something that has complicated the whole thing? Have we sinned against God? But he says here, for your sake. In other words, they were sent down to Babylon for their own sake and for their own benefit and for their own blessing. And many things that we go through in life are for our own benefit and our own blessing. Because Christ says, as you have tried me, I shall come forth as fire. And sometimes when we go through the trials of life, that they're talking about the precious trials. Now, sometimes there can be anything but precious to us. But God says even in the midst of them, he's there with us and he's helping us and he's, he's bringing us through. He said, because uh, for your sake, I have sent you to Babylon. I have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. In other words, listen, look, it doesn't matter the power of Babylon. It doesn't matter what they have. One day I will judge Babylon and then I will bring my own people out of Babylon. And God did judge them as he had said he would do because of the treatment of his people. And can I say this morning, there's a number of things in this little portion, first of all, where God uses words for his own people, for those he knows, for those he loves, for those who, who belong to him. And I want to look at a few of them this morning very quickly because there's a fourfold picture of God if we get time to look at it here. If not, we'll move on. But what I want to say, there, there, are, there are five things that God says that he is to us, uh, that we are sorry to him. If you read through verse one, it says, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. And the word redeemed is mentioned further on down in this passage as well. But folks, can I say, first of all, we are a redeemed people. If you take, look up that word redeemed, it's, it's to pay a price to ransom something. So in other words, it's, it's to pay the price so that, that that item could be set free. And, and it really comes from, from, from the idea of, of something you maybe had pawned and something you'd put into the pawnbrokers and you, you got a price for it. But you had a certain price to pay to redeem that or to get that back. So when you went in and you paid the price, you were able to get it back. And that's what the word redeemed means. It says here, listen, we're redeemed because it's something that you've brought out of danger. It's something that you've brought out of bondage and you have redeemed it. And that's what God says to us. Listen, we're in danger because folks, if we continue on a, on a road away from God, if we continue on a road far away from God, folks, we're going to end up in the place in eternity we don't want to end up. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, as it says in Matthew 7, and many there be that go in thereat. But narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that go in. So it's a place that's in danger. And if you continue down along the broad road, there's only one place we're going to end up. And that's in a lost eternity, as the scripture says. That's in hell. So that's the broad road. And then we have the narrow way that leads to life. So it's danger and it's in bondage. You know, many people think today, listen, because we don't have anything to do with God, because we don't, we don't have any spiritual idea at all, you know, we're, we're free. We're free to do exactly what we like. But you know, it's the actual opposite. They're, they're not free at all. 
They're under bondage because they're under bondage to Satan and they're under bondage to sin. They're under bondage to self. That's the simple reality. You see, Christ has come to set us free and to make us new creatures in Christ Jesus. And he noticed the term here, I have redeemed thee. If you go into verse 14, he even says, your redeemer. So he's come to set us free. And the price was the Lord Jesus Christ dying upon the cross for us. So I suppose the first question, we're a redeemed people. Is he your redeemer? It's not the wonderful thing this morning. That's the greatest question that you can answer. You can say, yes, he's my redeemer. He's my savior. He's my Lord. So we're redeemed people. In verse four, if you move down there, it says, since thou wast precious in my sight. Can I say this morning, we are a precious people to him. You know, there's not one of us the same here this morning. We're, we're all different. That's the wonderful thing about us. Our eyes are all different. They might, some might be the same color, but they're all different because it's the same as a fingerprint. It's completely different. There's not one of us here with the same fingerprint because, folks, we're all different. If you look up the word precious, it means of great cost, of great value. It means beloved. And what he's saying to you this morning, you're not only redeemed people, but you're a precious person to him. Each and every one of you that knows him, you're precious. He calls us a peculiar people. He calls us a, a treasured people. But folks, we are a loved people. And what he's saying here when he's speaking about precious is, is that he will do all to save his people. He will do all for his people because we are precious to him. It's not wonderful this morning as his child to know that I am precious to him, that you are precious to him. So we're not only redeemed people, we're not only a precious people, but folks, can I say we, we are a created people. And the word creation is used three times here in verse one and in verse 15 and also in verse seven. It says in verse seven there, even every one of you that is called by my name, for I have created him. And the reason I took it from here, because he said, I have created him for my glory. Why did he create us? He created us that we would glorify him. He created us to be his people. You know, it's wonderful to be adopted into the family of God, because that's what we are. When we come to Christ, we're adopted into the family of God. The scripture also talks about being engrafted into the family of God. I remember a, a, a good number of years ago, I don't think I still have it, I think it died on me, but there, there was a plant I bought and there was a bit coming out the side of it. And I thought to myself, what, what's that there? And I looked at that plant and, and it was completely engrafted into the side of the other plant. So what happened was one side of the plant you had, you had white flowers and the other side of the plant you had yellow flowers. You see, it was something that was engrafted in, but it, it was part of the single thing because it got all its roots from, from the stem and it was engrafted in. And that's what it's saying. God longs to just engraft us into his family. God longs to adopt us into the family of God. And why? So that you and I will be able to glorify him. Man's chief aim is to glorify God. How do we glorify him? We do it in our lives each and every day. What do people see as they look at your life and as they look at my life each and every day? Do they see Christ? I was thinking of a few things that, that he can see. His praise. As we go out, are we those who, who are praising God? As we live our lives each and every day, is, is the praise of God lived out? Because, folks, that's what people should see. We're praising our God, his power. God working in us and God working through us. You see, as his people, we're, we're a powerful people because he has strengthened us. 
and he's enabled us to be a powerful people. His promise. Folks, can, do people see that we trust God and we take God at his word and we believe his wonderful promise? Folks, we can also see his provision that he has taken care of us. We can see his protection as we've already looked at. But what do people see? I wonder this morning when they look at your life and they look at my life. You see, he has created people. We are a created people. You know, folks, can I say the fourth little thought here? We didn't read this verse, but go down to it, verse 21. We're simply God's people. You know, the, the, the little hymn writer said, the, the hymn writer said, that little chorus that said, it's good to be a part of the family of God. And it's not tremendous. You know, we had folks there from, from America over some time ago, and, and you know, they were delighted coming in because they're part of the family of God. How many times have we gone on holidays or gone to somewhere else in Ireland or, or in some part of the world? And we've met someone else who, who's a Christian as well. And we, we've, we've met and we're part of the family. But as part of that family, what are we doing? It's to preserve the remembrance of his name. You see, we live out each and every day to preserve the remembrance of his wonderful name. That's the reality, because we are God's people. And the last little thought here is that we, we are a remembered people. We're a remembered people. Turn over to verse 26. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. We're, we're a remember people. The language here of the word remembrance is just the illustration given that it's somebody pleading a defense in a courtroom. And you know, you, you use everything that is possible to plead that defense. And you know, I suppose many of you now in our house, they're, they're, they're watching that trial at the minute Yes, see, Amy's nodding up at me. She says, don't say too much about it. Johnny Depp, I don't know if any of you are watching it or what you're watching at the minute. Uh, but, you know, the, every, every defense is being used to bring in. And what the Lord is saying, he says, use everything at your disposal because I am your God. I will bring you into remembrance. I will remember everything. Plead every single argument that you have because I am listening. And I thought, isn't that the wonderful description of God? Because sometimes we tend to forget in life when, when trials or problems or, or different things come our way. Sadly, can I say sometimes the last place we go to is the place of prayer. Instead of it being the first, to lay hold upon God in prayer. I remember at the Bible college, we, we were in prayer one morning and I don't know if you do this, well, you shouldn't, but, but I did anyway. And I remember one of the men there, he was praying. And, and I opened my eyes. Anybody open their eyes in a prayer meeting? Go on, anybody, put your hands up. Aye, very good, I'm glad, because I, I knew there was, because I've seen you opening your eyes in the prayer meeting, so that's just what I don't know. But you know something? Folks, we, we open our eyes maybe to see or maybe to just change the position of our eyes. That's what I always like to say. But, you know, I opened my eyes that day and I saw this man and he was praying, but he was pleading. And this is the way he was praying. He was praying for God to come down. And he was praying for God to answer. And folks, this is what the idea of this are remember people. We're praying and we're pleading on God to come and to look after our situation. It's not chorus through this morning. God is still on the throne. And he will remember his own. His promise is true. He will not forget you. Why? Because God is still on the throne. That's our God. And folks, we have to remember this this morning, that we are a redeemed people. We're a precious people. We're a created people. We're God's people. We're a remembered people. Because here, Isaiah said to the people, this is to encourage you. In the midst of everything, be encouraged. Because God will never forget his own. 
Folks, can I say, and I know time doesn't permit me, but I just want to look at one or two of them this morning. If you move on to verse 15, we get a fourfold reminder of who God is. And sometimes we can forget. Why do we have our service of communion that we're going to have next Sunday? Because the hymn writer said, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lead me to Calvary. Christ said, do this in remembrance of me, because we tend to be a people who forget. When we're going through a difficult time, when we have problems in our lives, we forget really sometimes how big our God is. And sometimes our problems become far bigger than God, when it should actually be the other way around. Our problems are small compared to the mightiness of our God. He's a mighty God. And here we have four wonderful things he's called in verse 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. And there's four different illustrations here that will bring blessing to you no matter what time you're going through in your life. First of all, he's the Lord. And simply he's just saying, he's Jehovah. He's Jehovah. And if you want to look through, I look through there during the week, eight times in the first 17 verses, He uses the word Lord. So he's trying to repeat something. Listen, don't forget the Lord. He's still here. He's the self-existent one. He's the one who exists in himself. He has all existence. He has all personality. And he is Jehovah. And folks, I'm not going to have time to go through all the different personalities of God this morning because you've heard me preaching them on before and I'm not going to go over them again, but I want to leave them with you. He's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide whatever your need is. Spiritual, physical, he will provide. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth. Physical healing, spiritual healing, he will heal. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner, the Lord our protector. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. What do we need in the day? What does man not have today? I believe that's one of the biggest peace. You see, Christ says to us, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled. How many hearts are troubled around our world today when folks, he said, listen, I'm going to give you peace and I'm going to give you perfect peace. He's Jehovah Shalom. He's Jehovah Raha, the Lord my shepherd. It's not what the psalmist said in Psalm, in Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. Folks, we, we've no want in life and we've no want in death either. Because he is our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. You know that wonderful psalm yourself. That's what he can do for every one of us because he is the Lord, our shepherd, who takes care of the sheep. Jehovah Sekenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present. He'll not leave us. He will not forsake us. That's what the Lord means here. And folks, if we can get that simplistically into our mind, don't look into it too much. Just take God at your word. He's going to provide. He's going to heal. He's going to protect. He's going to give peace. He's going to be our shepherd. He's going to be our righteousness. He's going to be present with us. How big are our problems going to be? Because we have a great big God. That's the wonderful thing. He is the Lord. Secondly, here, he he is the Holy One. He is the Holy One. And folks, sometimes we, we, we forget about the holiness of God. We, we live in a, in a very sinful world. And we, we live in a, very, in a world that is, that is led by sin and is dominated by sin because it's led and dominated by the God of this world. But what does your God and my God demand of us? He demands a, a holy life. There in verse 14, it says, it says, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. But verse 15, it puts in another word. If you read it, it says, your Holy One. He puts your before it. Holy is belonging or devoted to God. You're holy one. I am holy. So he's saying, listen, folks, 
I long that you will be holy as well. And God is looking at a people who have departed from him and are in Babylon because they've sinned against God. They're living an unholy life and they should be living a holy life. He's looking at the nation of Babylon, a sinful nation who totally go away from God. And he's saying, listen, I long that you, my people, will be holy. He was asking his own people to live holy lives. But he was also saying one, or one wonderful thing here. He's telling his people that as a holy God, he will make good on every word that he has given to them. You see, as a holy God, he cannot go against his word. When he has promised to bring them out of bondage, he will do it. And can I say what he has promised to do for you and for me, he will do it. He was saying, listen, you my people, take me at my word. What I have said to you, I will fulfill it. I was speaking to a wee woman recently, and with this, with this I finish. This wee woman was, was speaking to me. And she said, you know, I was reading my daily quiet time. And as I was reading my daily quiet time, the Lord gave me a word. And she says, you know, I, I thought it was a wonderful word of what he was going to do. And she said, I, 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 you know, I looked at it, I read it, I, I prayed over it, I did everything. But she said, I had no real peace about it. And she says, I went, I went and I spoke to a minister that I know. And she said, after I spoke to the minister, and I told him about the word that I had got. And I said to this minister, I said, you know, this is the word that, that God has given to me. And he replied to her, he says, I don't think that it's just a word. I think that it's a promise from God. And she asked me, Mervyn, do you think it's a promise? And I said, I do. God has given you a promise. And God will keep his word. And sometimes, folks, if God has given us a promise, it may take a year. It may take two years. It may take five years. It may take ten years. I remember a man speaking here one night, and he said it was over 40 years before God fulfilled his promise. Time is not the problem, folks. The reality for you and me is that God has given his word. And the God who has given us his word is the God who will keep his word because he's a holy God. He's a holy God and he will keep his word. He's the creator. Folks, we can also see in verse 15 and then he's your king. And I trust as the creator, you remember you're created for his honor and glory. But also as your king, remember that he's to be king over your life in every single aspect. Amen.
Come with joy, I sing. 